Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. We have a very exciting two-part series here now for you, and this is our two-part interview with Chris Rolls. Now, Chris Rolls is a serial entrepreneur who's built and sold four businesses, three of which were amongst the largest of their kind in Australia. Chris then went on to found a Pie Lab Venture Partners in 2016, which is a venture capital fund that invests in early stage technology businesses focused on the real estate sector. And in this two-part series, Chris brings to us a very interesting approach of both having the experience of buying and selling businesses, so the sell side experience, and also now from 2016 onwards, the experience as a buyer. Now, in part one of this two-part series, we're digging into Chris's background, his experience in buying businesses that he ultimately sold. And in part two, we venture into looking at his experience on the flip side as a buyer of businesses. Now, in this first part of the two-part series, we look at not just Chris's experience in building businesses to sell, but the learnings along the way. And please ensure that after you listen to this episode, you make sure you hunt down uh, part two where we get into that experience um, of Chris as a buyer and what he now is looking for in businesses that he acquires. And don't forget to check out our show notes. If you're interested in finding out more about Chris and PyLab, then just hit our show notes where we link straight through to Chris. Right, well, without further ado, here we go with our part one of our two-part series with Chris Rolls. Chris, welcome to the podcast. It is so fabulous to have you on today. Thanks, uh, Joe. Looking forward to it. Should be an interesting conversation. Oh, absolutely. I absolutely can tell that. It absolutely is. Okay, Chris, now we have a two part series here. And in this first part of our two part series, we're hearing a bit about your background because it is a very interesting background indeed. And I think there's a lot of lessons there um, for our buyers um, and sellers uh, listening in um, at the moment. So why don't you give us a bit of a snapshot of your background? Um, start from the beginning. Tell us where you've been in this journey of, um, of business sale and acquisitions. Sure. So um, I I started my first business actually when I was at when I was at school. Uh, I started our school canteen, and um, I love it. When I was probably in about year eight or year nine, uh, and we used to buy uh, chocolate bars and cans of soft drink from uh, Franklin's at the time. I'm not sure if you remember oh, the Franklin supermarket chain. Yeah. I think they're gone. Yes. Uh, take them to school, and we used to sell them, and uh, that was my first ever business. And we actually had. Um, people in each of the different years who would sell the different uh, things for us. And it was a, a great little business. Love it, you had just two um, <laughs> That's right. That's right. Because we always, we knew all the people in year nine, but of course we didn't know all the, the kids in year eight or year 10 or, or whatever. And, uh, and that was my first ever business. And that was a great business um, because, I, well, first of all, we didn't pay any tax. That was the first thing. <laughs> I didn't even know what it was. Uh, it was all cash and um, it was it was instantly profitable. But... Um, um, it wasn't uh, it wasn't that great for that long because when I got to about halfway through year ten, the school opened their own school tuck shop, and of course uh, uh, they were better capitalised than me, and we went and we went broke. Uh, people stopped buying stuff of us, so <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my first business. Um, first lesson on competition. My, uh, I love it. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly right. But um, you know, my first proper business was uh, a clothing manufacturer, a company called Scody Performance Wear that manufactures cycling and triathlon clothing. They're still around today, but I, I sold it probably 20 years ago. Uh, I started that when I was at, at uni. I was a, a sort of a mad keen cyclist and triathlete, and uh, we started manufacturing clothing, and uh, it went really well. We sort of built that to the stage. We had probably, I don't know, 15, 20% share of the Australian market at that time in my very early 20s. and. Um, uh, that was a business that uh, was was a lot of fun. So, and that was my first uh, experience of selling a business, and uh, I did it really badly. 
Uh, <laughs> in what way? So, Tell us uh, why. What, what did you do? Before? Well, I came into work one day and my um, – I was I had owned half of it with with one of my my best mates and uh, who's who's still uh, one of my best mates and uh, I said to him I said look I'm a bit sick of this and uh, you know we've grown really well I reckon we should sell this and so he agreed okay let's sell it and then the next day we came in with we're going to go and see the accountant and he had a change of heart and he said uh, I don't really want to sell it how about how about I buy your share and I said oh okay. Um, so we had a conversation for five minutes, uh, came up with the price, and the deal was done. <laughs> well, it sounds and what easy. I, uh, well, it sounds easy, except uh, three years later, he sold my share for 10 times what I sold it to, to, to him. Uh, and it wasn't for the, for the record. It wasn't him taking advantage. We were completely naive. We had no idea what it was worth. I had no idea what it was worth. I had an amount of money that I, I had in my mind that I, that I needed to go and do my next thing. Um, and he was willing to pay it, and turns out I completely undersold it. So um, that was my first experience of, of selling a, a business, and uh, I've built and sold four businesses, four proper ones. Um, so that was the, the first one. And can I just um, say, reflecting yeah. on that, were there what were what were the main what elements out of that whole experience did you take moving forward? I mean, obviously you didn't go through a formal process and, and you know, I understand that. But I do, you, you, you know, I talk to business owners day in, day out. Um, I'm an entrepreneur at heart too and I feel that all of our early ventures, you, you know, create this culmination of experience. So so what are the, what were those lessons that you took on? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is uh, don't, don't, don't come up with a price in five minutes <laughs> while, while you're having a, a beer after work and sell your business <laughs> that you've been, you've been building for the last three years. Plan so that's the first piece of more. learning. <laughs> Plan it more than five minutes in advance. Um, I think, I mean, I've exited a few now and I think, um, and, and even the sort of, I, I look at it over time, um, I, I've gotten better at it. Um, and, and doing what I do now, which is investing in businesses, uh, I've been through the process many times. I think, you know, absolutely preparation is the key. And, and you know, while five minutes isn't long enough, I think even, even a year or more, um, you know, really needs to be where you're aiming at um, and, and planning sort of to, towards that over time. So um, the other thing I've learned, and I've, I've gone through processes where I think I've, I've learned from my experiences um, over time. Um, I think, you know, things like having the right accountants working with you, having the right lawyers working with you um, makes a massive difference. Um, so, and I've used a combination of different things and, and more importantly, when we've bought businesses off people, I've seen them use, you know, really poor quality advisors. And it's not that they're bad lawyers, they're just lawyers that don't do, you know, M&A transactions very often. Uh, and you see transactions fall apart. So I think, you know, there's a whole range of things that I've learned, but, you know, preparation, good advisors, understanding who your market is uh, and getting an, an understanding of what businesses are worth when you go through the sale process. Love it. I love it. And and I think you're absolutely right. This is uh, one of the things that I talk about a lot, that the, this misunderstanding in the market about uh, advisors who are generalist advisors or commercial advisors, so, you know, talking about lawyers, accountants, uh, whoever, who um, deal with, uh, you know, there's this perception that commercial lawyers understand business sale and acquisitions because they're lawyers in the commercial space, right? But um, it's so often the case that our generalist um, lawyers just don't deal with business sale and acquisition on a day-to-day -day basis and so don't understand the nuances. No, I always liken it to sort of uh, a GP, you know, um, you, you don't go to your GP to get heart surgery. You go to a heart surgeon and they're, and they're very different things. Your typical accountant deals with tax. Your typical lawyer um, deals with commercial contracts, predominantly everyday business stuff like lease agreements and, you know, and, and they'll be spread across a whole range of different things, both, you know, business, you know, personal uh, wills, estates, you know, you, you, you mergers and acquisitions and, 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 and the legal transaction documents, um, you know, around the sale of business are a very specialist topic. Um, and, and what's interesting, it's not just that, that you, you know, if you use the, the wrong lawyer that you'll get the wrong advice. Um, it actually increases the chance of the transaction falling over because, I mean, I've seen on the other side, you know, lawyers come back with things that are completely uncommercial. And I look at that and think, there's no way 
and we're not asking for things that are unreasonable. We're just asking things that are, that that most um, lawyers that are experienced in mergers and acquisitions would understand that that's a that's a completely normal ask. Um, and and you see transactions fall over unnecessarily as a result of those sorts of things. Now I interrupted you. You told us about your first, uh, well, your second business, really, your clothing business. What was after that? Uh, so I've had a few. Um, so after that, I I started a business called First Class Accounts. Actually, I, I, I invested alongside um, a guy who I was doing some consulting work with. Uh, this is a while ago. This is when the GST was introduced, and he had a business. It was kind of like small business accounting. So he was helping small businesses um, with their, you know, their bookkeeping, helping them computerize their accounts. And of course, what happened is the government uh, of the day introduced the goods and services tax, and all of a sudden his phone just rang off the hook. There just weren't enough accountants, advisors, bookkeepers around to deal with the, you know, two million businesses that had to computerize their accounts. You know, all move on to MYOB or QuickBooks at the time. Zero didn't exist. Um, back then. And so we franchised that business. And 18 months later, we had sort of 120 franchises around Australia. So we were sort of in the right place at the right time um, with, you know, this, this, you know, very rapidly growing business. Um, and so that was the sort of, uh, and, and, and then, uh, you know, while I had that, um, I actually invested in a business that some friends of mine were running in the real estate industry. And uh, I helped them uh, out on weekends because it was, it was a, a lot of fun. And I came to the conclusion it was actually more fun than accounting. And they uh, asked if I would come on board as the, as the, as the full-time CEO. Uh, and so I said, yes. So I, I stepped out of the accounting business and went through a sale process with that, um, and, uh, which I did, I think, a better job with, uh, but certainly didn't get it you know, completely right. Um, and why? And then moved into the real estate industry. Oh, look, I think, um, once again, preparation. So it was one of those uh, things where I wasn't expecting to sell it. This other opportunity came up. Um, and, and I think also at the time, I didn't understand the nuances of how to get a business to run by itself because that was a really good recurring revenue business. Um, and I kind of had this view, well, if I'm not the CEO, I therefore need to sell it, which was you know, completely you know, an, an incorrect um, and, and inexperienced assumption. Um, and so therefore I didn't have the time to prepare, you know, for the sale process. Uh, and interestingly, you know, a, a, you know, a business is typically worth far more, uh, if it's under management and being run without the founder who's exiting, you know, uh, you know, being a major part of the day-to-day -day business. I just didn't know that at the time. So there's things like that, you know, that, that, that I learned. Um, but certainly I did a better job than the first one. Uh, so I was, <laughs> well, that's good. We're on the right trajectory. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's exactly right, and um, you know the the and then the the real estate business was probably I think the one I've executed best in terms of first of all uh, I, I got into the industry I invested in that business because it's a, an industry that has a you know recurring revenue annuity income stream and what I'm talking about there is the property management aspect of real estate so if you look at the real estate industry uh, I'm talking residential real estate there's about eight thousand real estate agencies around Australia. Uh, the bulk of them generate most of their revenue from sales, so selling um, properties. Uh, almost all of them do some element of property management, which is managing uh, investment properties, so putting tenants in, collecting the rent, doing um, um, inspections, doing maintenance, etc. Um, but typically, it's an industry that's serviced very poorly, and that's because the people that own most real estate businesses are salespeople, and they're out focusing on selling property, and their property management is sort of the poor cousin. Uh, we took a view that. Um, that's actually the biggest opportunity. So really good quality business that sell for high multiples um, and poor competition because you know most business owners in the industry aren't focused on it. And so we built uh, a very large business, uh, one of the largest in Australia. So we uh, had a, a portfolio of about two and a half billion dollars of property, uh, predominantly around Queensland. I'm, I'm based in Brisbane. Um, and uh, we sold that um, uh, probably about seven or eight years ago now. Um, and uh, to, a, to a national player, um, and we were a good fit for them. Uh, and it's also a business that's fairly easy to value, so you don't have too many issues in terms of negotiation around valuations because they're businesses that sell very, very well because the buyer is effectively buying a, a contracted revenue stream. Um, and you know, I went through a much better process. I had uh, better advisors. I had prepared for that, um, you know, and it was a it was a good outcome. Love it. 
Um, and when you entered the business, did you uh, you entered the business obviously at the same time that you were um, involved in the accounting business? But as you were leading, building, uh, leading into building the business, did you have in your mind now planning for exit, given your last two experiences? Yeah. So, so the answer is yes. So I think a lot of people get into business, and I certainly did as well. Without really any plan, you kind of go. Oh, I'm going to start a business, and you're going to get. You know, I'm going to start. I'm going to make some money. I'm going to, you know, get some customers, and you know, if our revenue is more than our expenses, then things are going pretty well. Uh, and then I've got a business, and and you know, most people don't think about well, well, how long are you going to do it for? What do you want to achieve? You know, how are you going to grow it? Um, what do you actually want your business to look like? And and as a result of that, a lot of people get themselves into a sort of a a situation where their business pretty much dominates their lives. Um, I think a lot of people get into running businesses with this idea that I can be the boss and I can, you know, work um, convenient hours and then they get in there and they realise that actually that's not how it works. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. You end up working more hours, often earning less than what you did previously. Um, and that's, I think, partly as a result of a, of a lack of understanding and a, and a lack of planning as to what they want to do with their business. So certainly with that business, absolutely, it was a business that we were building to sell. Love it. Okay. And then where to next after that? So after that, um, so that was about seven years ago. And then uh, I, that's where I decided that I was going to start investing in businesses. Um, and so I started a, a firm called PyLab Capital. And what we do is we acquire businesses uh, we sometimes acquire 100% of them. Sometimes we acquire, you know, a majority of them, and work with the, uh, you know, partner with the person that's there to help grow those businesses. Um, and uh, we do that on behalf of our investors. So our investors invest in our fund, and we go out and acquire small and medium businesses and help them grow. And that's really sort of the next, uh, the next segment of uh, of my journey that I'm working on at the moment. And the next segment of our podcast, as it turns out, too. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely but um but before we finish off um with, with this part one of the two-part series and and look i'm i'm really excited for part two where we where we talk about business acquisitions and and looking at that process through a buyer's eyes because i think that's such an important insight um for people who are building to sell or cl close to the point of at exit to be able to recognize. But before we get to that, I just want to come back to these learnings. And you, you talked about this in the beginning, um, but preparation is the key um, and, um, and having the right deal team. Are there any other sort of insights, uh, I guess, that you you have gleaned through through your experiences? Yeah, sure. I think, um, you know, I think, I think one of those is if you're thinking of selling a business, looking at it through the eyes of the buyer and what the buyer and, and, and most importantly, what are the risks to that buyer? Um, so as an example, one of the things I often see when, um, you know, we go to, to, to acquire businesses is you have a history of little or no profitability. And then over the last two years, all of a sudden profitability has gone through the roof. Now that just rings alarm bells. Um, you know, why, why has there been five years of no profit and two years of good profits? Um, so understanding, and, and there may be good reasons for it, but being able to really map those out, um, you know, buyers like businesses, you know, when, when you think about it, what is a buyer buying when they're buying a business? They're, they're looking to acquire a, an ongoing income stream. Um, sometimes they want to be doing that passively. Sometimes they want to be doing it actively by working in the business. Um, but there's no question that your business is worth more if you, if, if you can provide a scenario where that business is a standalone entity with its own management in place and, and that's a, that can be a, a passive investment for someone. Um, so that's, um, that's a, you know, an, an important part of that is understanding the risks, um, you know, from a buyer's perspective and showing them how the potential perceived risks can be mitigated. Uh, so that's one of the things that I think is important. And then I think the other thing that's really important is having an honest conversation with the people internally, because whether you like it or not, your, your people internally have quite a large influence on the buyer's willingness to buy your business. Because um, when you think about it, when you buy a business, most businesses in the Australian economy um, don't have a lot of assets. They're not asset heavy businesses. We are a service based uh, economy. Uh, so usually very few tangible assets uh, other than, 
you know, computers, desks, maybe a fleet of cars. We don't have sort of, you know, many businesses with heavy machinery. We're not into manufacturing. And so therefore, you know, given we're predominantly a services economy, um, the services are provided by a group of people. So thinking about how can you ensure that if those people were to leave, which is always a concern of a buyer, um, you can recruit more people and get them up to speed quickly. And, and that can involve having things like training programs, having processes in place so that the, 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 the revenue stream that's generated by those people, if they leave, doesn't disappear. Um, and so there, you know, that's, I think, the way to look at it. And of course, the risks are, are, um, are unique to each different type of business. So you can't just sort of say, well, if you do X, you'll get a good outcome. I think you've got to look at your individual business and sort of say, well, what are the risks to someone who doesn't know what I know about the business? And of course, the, the big thing when you're selling a business that's, that I've found, and, and I've found it on both sides, both selling it and buying it, is the information asymmetry. Uh, as a seller, you will always know more about your business than the buyer will until they've bought it and been in there for a couple of years. Um, and as a buyer, you, you, just don't, you just don't know the risks. And so one of the things that, that happens is the seller sort of has this, very often has this view of, um, you know, there are no risks. This is a great business. It's really stable. And that's because you've been in it for 10 years and you know it and you know the industry and you know the suppliers and you know the people. Um, but the buyer doesn't know that. And that information asymmetry is where you see the gap between, you know, expected price of the seller, um, you know, and, and what the buyer will pay. And bringing that gap together is all about mitigating those risks. Absolutely love it, Chris. I just want to say a huge thank you for coming onto the podcast. I'm super looking forward to having you on part two. No worries. Thanks, Joe. Well, that's it for this episode of the Deal Room Podcast. We hope you're now primed for your next deal with these pointers and have enjoyed these fascinating insights. Now, if you'd like more information about this topic, then head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com where you'll be able to download a transcript of this episode as well as access any contact details and any other additional information we referred to in today's podcast. Now, if you'd like to get in contact with our guests today and the services they offer, you can go ahead and check out our show notes for a link right through to them and their details. You can also book in directly with our legal legals at Aspect Legal. If you'd like to soundboard your next steps, discuss a legal question, or find out more how we can assist, whether that's with buying or selling a business, or perhaps somewhere in between. Now, don't forget to subscribe to The Deal Room Podcast on your favorite podcast player to get notifications whenever a new episode is out. We'd also love to hear your feedback, so please leave us a review and rating if you're already one of our subscribers or even if you're listening to this podcast for the very first time. Every review helps our team produce valuable content for you. Well, thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to Joanna Oki and the Deal Room Podcast, a podcast proudly brought to you by our commercial legal practice, Aspect Legal. See you next time. I am so very excited to announce that I've hit a non-podcast related milestone and released a book. You might wonder why? Simple. I wanted to help business owners understand the mechanics of deal making and the interaction between three critical phases of business, acquisition, growth and exit. And so I am very happy to announce Buy, Grow, Exit, a guidebook for business owners and their advisors on how to buy, grow, and guess what, exit in a way that maximizes value and avoids landmines along the way. The book is available now, so just head over to buygrowexit.com.au to get your copy and to access a whole heap of free resources that will really help you on your journey of acquisition, growth, and exit in your business or in working with your clients. Also check out our show notes where we will link straight through to that page. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen. that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to the Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au.